Hey everybody, welcome to the Lighthouse Experience. Now I'm telling you, gather everything you need, get the kids ready, get the couch ready, wherever you're gonna be worshiping, and get some room, because you're gonna need it. And get ready, because we're about to go into the sanctuary and prepare your hearts for a dynamic word, some transformational worship. This is Lighthouse Experience. I'll see you afterwards. so that you can give God all of the praise. Hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We'll say this is the day that the Lord has made.
and we lift up your name and magnify you because you are the only God. There's none that compares to you, none that can challenge you, none that can supersede you. We esteem you this day that you are the Lord our God. You are our deliverer. You are our healer. You are our, our way maker. You are the God that even in the midst of crisis, peace in the midst of storm, you are the God who keeps us even when we don't want to be kept. And so God, today we give you glory in our moments of prayer, in our moments of fasting, in our moments of praise. We lift our heart to declare that you are the most high God. And wherever some of us are in our homes, in our kitchens, in the car. Some of us, we're creating a sanctuary wherever we are to declare that this is a day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice in your goodness. We will rejoice in your faithfulness. We will rejoice in the integrity of your word. Now, Father, you are the God who knows what we are not saying, who feels what we feel, who hears what we don't know how to utterly say. And so, God, we lift every care to you, every concern to you. And with those cares, we stand on your promise and your promises are yes and amen. And so, God, for every situation, for every dilemma, every problem, everything, every sickness, we declare that you are the answer. You are the healer. You are the resolution. You are the solution. You are the keeper. And you are the reconciler. You are the propitiation for our sin. And so we say to the pits of hell, say that the Lord rebukes you. And we say to our accusers, the blood covers. And we say to our future that the best is yet to come. We decree it. We declare it and we release it to the atmosphere. Now, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The things that you've said about us, what you've spoken about us, let it be done on earth as you've spoken in heaven. And we decree it, we declare it to the name of the Most High God. Be high and be lifted up. And to you we give an everlasting praise. And we say hallelujah in the name of Jesus we declare it. Yeah. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I'm not
We thank God for the praise and worship ministry <clears throat> of our praise and worship team. They come ready to go every single time. You know, I believe that worship is the conduit by which God connects with his creation. And I am a worshiper. I told you that Sunday I'm a worshiper. I love to do it. It's a part of my DNA. It's a part of my strategy. It's a part of my structure. I love to commune with him. And I hope that what we're doing in the praise and worship sense is meeting you and your need, and I hope that the Word of God is a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. Today, I have a word for you. Um, it's an oldie but goodie. Uh, and believe it or not, I've never preached this scripture. I've never preached this scripture. I've quoted it a thousand times, but I've never preached it. Here's what the Word of the Lord says. It's found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. It says, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. I'm going to read that again for your hearing. In the King James Version, it says, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. I want to talk on this subject for the next few moments. Salt in the wound. That's what I want to talk about. Salt in the wound. Without extreme proliferation as it relates to the introduction of this sermonic expression, I think that the text is pregnant with its own possibilities and worthy of diving right in without the assistance of my mental capacity. Just the text itself lends itself to deliverance. The scripture is clear. It's clear. It's concise. It says, we are the salt of the earth. Bottom line, who is ye, you and I, the Christian, the believer? <clears throat> we are those of us who have confessed with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised his son from the dead, those of us who have been baptized in the faith, those of us who believe in the gifts of the Spirit, ye, you, you and I are the salt of the earth. Now, when the Bible says consider this, you have to always consider the time, what we call context and culture, of when and where the text was written and distributed to men. When the Bible says that ye are the salt of the world, maybe it doesn't resonate to you and I as it should because of the way we view salt. See, because a perspective is really a reality. It doesn't matter what a thing is. What matters is how you see a thing, how you consider a thing. You have to consider then that at the times of antiquity and in the moments that Matthew wrote this text inspired by the Holy Spirit, you have to go back to Matthew's mind to find out why he would use salt, something that you pay 50 cents for. You know, when you go to a restaurant, when you walk in on the table, 
There is no filet mignon because it's too valuable. You have to order that. When you walk into a restaurant, there is no calamari sitting on the table. It's too expensive. You have to order that. When you walk into a restaurant, you don't get a complimentary bottle of red wine or white wine. There is no spirits on the table. Uh, there is no dessert on the table. All of that has to be ordered. There are a couple of things that come gratis. There are a couple of things that, that are given to you at most restaurants without your request. At most restaurants, there are at least two things on the table prior to your arrival. One is pepper. The other one is salt. It's so cheap and so irrelevant that they put it on the table even if you're going to need it or not. They just, they just sit it there. They just, they just leave it there. And, and if you knock it over, you just sweep it off the table. And, and at the end of the, the shift, they take a larger container and they fill up the salt shaker and they put it back on and they leave it there all night because it's insignificant. But in Matthew's day, there would have never been any salt on the table. In Matthew's day, it would not have been insignificant because in the days of Matthew, in the days of Jesus, salt was a precious commodity. It was a valuable commodity, and it had a multiplicity of uses. You've got to understand this. This is very important because in the days of Scripture, salt carried so much weight. Salt was an important commodity. Today, it's common. Today it's common. We, we, don't, we don't even look at it as an expensive commodity, but gathering salt in the days of Jesus was a difficult proposition, and the only place you can find high-quality salt in Israel was near the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is so full of salt that its viscosity is so thick that a man, a car, can actually get into the Dead Sea, and I've done it, and you can float without treading water because the salt content versus the water content is so imbalanced that you can actually float in the Dead Sea without treading water. Here in America, if you go to Utah and you go to the lake there, it is so full of salt that, that, that a car can float in it because of the viscosity and the density of the water because the salt has taken away uh, the sinkability of H2O. And, and, and salt was valuable in Israel and they had to, to, to mine it the same way we did diamonds. It was an expensive proposition to get salt in the days of Jesus. So when Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth, when Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth, he's not talking about some common thing. When Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, he's not talking about some ordinary thing. When Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, he's talking about an expensive thing. When Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, he's talking about a thing that, that, that you have to go through something to ascertain. He's talking about a thing that, that you had to put some work in to get. He's talking about a thing uh, that, 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 that you have to understand that it is expensive to gather. That, that's from the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. He says that the salt is expensive to gather because the cost of a thing, thank you, Holy Spirit, the cost of the thing is not decided just by the thing. The cost of a thing is decided by how difficult it is to get the thing. You see, a diamond is not just expensive because it has been under pressure for millions of years because in order for that diamond to be under a cold, to be under pressure for many years, that didn't cost America anything. It didn't cost South America anything. God created that pressure. That, that pressure was not something that we instituted. That pressure was not something we created. God created that pressure. He was the one that described and decided the process from diamond would be a coal under pressure over many years. It doesn't cost man to do anything to create a diamond. So why is a diamond so expensive? It's expensive because of how much it costs man to get because of the machinery and, and, and all of the things that are necessary to cut a diamond so that it will have its color and brilliance for us. So the cost of a thing is not determined by the thing itself, but it is determined by how difficult it is to get it. And in the days of Jesus Christ, salt was difficult to get. 
Salt was hard to get. You, you had to work to get it, and that's why it is expensive. And, and, and so if that's the truth, and God says that we are the salt of the earth, then the first thing he's letting us know is that salt is precious, and you have to stop giving yourself over so cheaply. You got, you got to stop allowing yourself to be on anybody's table. You, you got to stop allowing yourself to be in anybody's life. You got to stop allowing yourself and your business to be a part of anybody's conversation. You got to stop walking with common things and stop thinking commonly and having common conversations and recognize that when Jesus Christ said that you are the salt of the earth, he was saying you are an expensive thing. Do you understand how hard it was for me to get you? I had to leave heaven, get down in the womb of a virgin. I had to be born of that virgin. I had to be ostracized and ridiculed. I had to live a life for 30 years and die at the age of 33 and go back to be at the right hand of the Father. Do you know how many millions and trillions of miles it is between my exodus and my genesis? And I did all of that to get you. You are the salt of the earth. Do you know how expensive you are? Do you know how much God had to go through to get to you? Do you know how expensive you are? Do you know how valuable you are? The Bible says you are the handiwork of God. I want you to recognize that you are not a cheap thing. You are an expensive thing. You are the handiwork of God created by Christ Jesus. And let me give you something else to put in your pipe and smoke it. All of the things that God created. When he created trees, he spoke it into existence. When he created water, he spoke it into existence. When he created the sun, he said, let there be light. When he created darkness, <clears throat> he spoke that thing. When he created the fowls of the air and the fish of the sea, he spoke it. But when he created man, he bent down into the dust and created it with his hands. Do you know you're the only thing God ever touched? You're the only thing God ever touched. He never touched a bird. He never touched a lion. He never touched a seagull. He never touched a seal. He never touched a shark. He never touched a whale. But you, he put his hands on. You are valuable. Stop playing yourself so cheap. I wish you were in church right now. I tell you to high five your neighbor. I know you can't touch nobody right now, but you don't have to social distance in your house. Touch everything and say you're expensive. Touch your daughter and tell them and let her, her know you're expensive. <clears throat> Touch your son and let him know, son, you're not cheap, you're expensive. God did a lot to get to you. You are the salt of the earth. You are precious. Can I tell you something? You're the salt of the earth. It was expensive then, it is cheap now. So when we spill it on the table, we sweep it off. I want to give you a new word in 2020. Don't let anybody else spill you. Don't let anybody else knock you over and walk away from you like you are not anything, like you are nothing. You are the salt of the earth. I want you to refuse to be wasted by anything or anybody. I want you to refuse to be wasted by any moment or anything. I want you to refuse to waste time. I want you to, we always tell, I'm, I'm killing time. Don't kill time. Utilize time. Don't let anything waste you. You are an expensive commodity. You're precious. Salt is precious. Number two. Not only is salt precious, salt is a preservative. In, in those days, they didn't have Viking refrigerators like you have in your house. In, in those days and times, they didn't have sub-zero refrigerators. In those days and times, there was no Home Depot or Lowe's to go to uh, to get a refrigerator. If you're in the Midwest, there was no Menards. There was no place. If you if you remember Sears and Roebuck, there was there was no satisfaction guaranteed. There was no refrigeration. So so how did they keep meat? What they did is they hung meat, which would allow the blood to drain from it. But that's only one part of the process. They would take salt and pack it on the meat. They would pack it on the meat. See, we think that, that when we put salt on our meat, we're seasoning it. But, but in those days and time, they were preserving it because the salt would draw the blood out and it would keep the flies away and it would keep the meat from decaying and it would keep the meat from rotting and it would keep the meat from spoiling because salt was a preservative. So what God is saying is, he says, you're the salt of the earth. He says, watch this, <clears throat> anywhere you are, death has to leave. In anywhere you are, if you utilize your power and your anointing, decay has to go. In other words, he's saying that any environment that you're in, you can preserve. And I decree and declare, when you find out that you're assault, you will stop the assault of the enemy on your family. And you'll start to say to your family, you shall live and not die. 
That when you understand that you are salt, that, that you can preserve your income. When you understand you are salt, you can, you can relent from the attacks of the enemy. When you recognize that you're salt, you'll understand that the reason why the enemy is after you is because as long as you're alive, God is going to preserve your seed. <laughs> you know, that's, why, that's why he wanted you to die in that car accident. That's why he wanted you to be afraid of breast cancer. That's why he wanted you to be afraid of lupus because if he could kill you, then he can get to the real thing, which is your seed. You understand that when the devil wanted to get back to God, he didn't attack God. He tried to kill his seed. And so when the devil wants you, he comes after your son and your daughter. And as long as you're in the earth praying for them and anointing them with oil, then you are preserving their life. So that's why the enemy is after you, because you have a preservative quality. You are, you are preservative. Listen, a lot of people may not know this, but back in the day, especially for those people who are a little more seasoned in life, we, we, young people, we eat jelly. We eat jelly. You, you know, you, you eat grape jelly and peach jelly and strawberry jelly. But if you grew up in Alabama and, and Arkansas and Mississippi and, 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 and you got some, some families, even if you live up north and you got some family members that came from the south, you know they had these mason jars. Now let me tell you something. That mason jar has a multiplicity of uses. It can be a Kool-Aid cup. It could, be, it could be a Tupperware that you can take food over to your family's house, but the original use of it was to make preserves, to put something in and to seal. It had a sealable quality so you can put it on the shelf and use it for later so that in a famine you'd always have a preserve. And in and, 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 and short times when you wasn't making the money, you had something on the shelf that you can ascertain. And God says, listen, you may want to be effective now. You may want to be rich now. You may want to be famous now. You may want your ministry big now. You may want to be a CEO now. You may want to be a supervisor now. God says you will be one day. But the reason why you are not today is because you're a preservative. I put you on the shelf so that when I could get all the cheap stuff out of the way, I can pull you off the shelf. I'm saving you because once this famine has started, you'll be utilized. And guess what? Anything used in the famine is appreciated. God told me to tell you, you're about to get off the shelf. God said, I've been preserving you. I know you wanted it by 45. I know you wanted it by 55. But God says, I couldn't deliver it right now because I preserved you for such a time as this. I declare a decree to about five thousand of you all, God is about to take you off the shelf. God is about to put you in the game. God is about to utilize you. God is about to put your strengths on display. God is about to use your gift. And God told me to tell you, he's about to make room for you. As a matter of fact, I dare you to speak to your atmosphere and say, make room for me because God's about to take me out the cabinet. God's about to take me off the shelf. God is about to utilize me in this season. God told me to tell you, he had not forgot about you. He preserved you. He hadn't forgot about you. He preserved you. And not only did he preserve you, he's going to use you to preserve others. Get ready. Get ready for God to do something right now. I don't know what it is, but you get it. You better get ready. COVID-19 was a preservative cavity for you. It was God putting you in a container and not containment. And when you bust out of this season, when you bust out of this depression, when you bust out of this frustration, here is the word of the Lord. And I'm saying it to the cameraman. God is about to show you your purpose. You're going to find out in this moment that God was using this moment to create a fire inside of you that will cause you to find out your destiny because you do not find out what you can do in peacetime. You find out what you can do in wartime. And in this season, in this season, God is about to show you what he intended to do for you. You didn't know it when you were in pain. You didn't know it when you had tears in your eye. You didn't know it when you were frustrated. But after you have come forth out of this fire, God says, I'm going to make sure that you shine like pure gold. God says, I'm doing something with you because you're precious. I'm doing something with you because you're a preservative. But number three, salt was a prophylactic. I know that's a big word. I'm going to tell you what it means. Only reason why I use it is because it started with a P with the rest. I could have used something else. But here it is. Salt was a prophylactic. And, and that what, what a prophylactic is, is a medicine that is applied to one who is sick. And in those days and times, they believed uh, uh, that, that salt was medicine. So much so that when anybody was sick in a bed or in a room, that once that person either got healed or they died, they would move that person out of that space and, and they started to sprinkle salt over the room. Help me, Holy Ghost. See, salt was their Lysol. Salt was their Clorox. They didn't have Clorox bleach. They didn't have, uh, uh, they didn't have aerosol cans. They didn't have all the things that we have. They didn't have Fabuloso. Help me, Holy Ghost. They didn't have Ajax. They, they, they didn't have Comet. They had salt. 
And whenever they tried to get rid of disease, they would throw salt in the room. This is what they would have done uh, in the advent of COVID-19, that with people with coronavirus, once those people were healed uh, or, or they had perished, they would come in the room and they would sprinkle salt over the room. Help me, Holy Ghost, because salt was a prophylactic. So when Jesus said, we are the salt of the earth, to those who heard him, he was saying that you have the power to heal anything you walk into. He's saying that you have the power to walk into a room and declare it free from evil because you're in the room. You, you have the power to lay your hands on your children and declare them healed psychologically, mentally, and physically in the name of Jesus. That means you have the power to speak ADHD off of your children. You have the power to speak uh, to, to childhood diabetes. You have the power to speak to childhood cancer. Why? Because God says that you have a healing power. And this is, this is why the enemy hates you, because he understands that if you ever find out how much power you have, God will start to sprinkle you in the room. I don't know who I'm talking to, but you're getting ready to go in the rooms you've never been in before. You're getting ready to go in the boardrooms. You're getting ready to go in the rooms where decisions are made. You, you're, you're normally used to crying in the bedroom. God says, I'm moving you from bedrooms to boardrooms. Help me, Holy Ghost. You're getting ready to get that, that stuff that you laid in the bed at night when you had your back up against the headboard and, and took out of the nightstand the book and you began to write the vision that God had for you and you took it and you put it back in the nightstand. God says, when you get up tomorrow, take it out of the nightstand because I'm getting ready to take that vision from the bedroom to the boardroom. I don't know who that word is for, but when we come out of this thing, God says, I'm going to sprinkle you all over the place just like he did with the seed of Abraham and the seeds of Joshua and made them as plentiful as the stars are in the sky. Isn't that amazing? Thank you, Holy Ghost. It's amazing because he says to Abraham, and this is revelation, this is a rhema word the Lord just gave me, he says that to Abraham, I'm getting ready to bless you as plentiful as the sea, the sand on the sea. But then he flips it and says, I'm going to make you as plentiful as the stars in the sky. And it just came to me that the sand represented man because it's dirt, but the stars represent the church. And God says, I'm going to multiply you in the spirit and in the flesh. I'm going to, I'm going to multiply you in every dimension. I'm going to multiply you in, in, in areas of influence. I'm going to multiply you in places you've never been. Get ready to have influence because you're a prophylactic. You are a healer. God is getting ready to sprinkle you all over the place. Somebody say, sprinkle me, Lord. Sprinkle me right now. Put me in places that I would never have been. Put me in places I've never dreamed of because you are the salt of the earth. Not only are you precious, not only are you preservative, not only are you a prophylactic, but God says you also are a protector. Because this is not the practice of the Christian, but in the days of Roman antiquity, they used to use salt to drive away evil spirits. You, you can still see that practice today, that they will use salt to drive away demons. That they will use salt to purify the spirits in their atmosphere. I don't know who this is for. But God just told me to tell you, you are a demon chaser, that, that you can cast demons out of your house. Help me, Holy Ghost. The reason why you won't do it is because you're scared. You won't, you're, you're scared, but you don't understand that the enemy is afraid of you. I was, I was uh, with my daughter yesterday, and we were riding on the bike, and she said something to me about a dog chasing her on the bike. I said, well, baby, if a dog chases you on the bike, what are you going to do? She says, I'm going to get off the bike and run. I said, baby, take it from a professional dog runner. You don't get off the bike and run on your feet. I said, I have ran from more dogs in my youth than you have seen in your life. I said, stay on the bike. She said, why, Daddy? I said, because the dog is going to try to bite your feet. She said, Daddy, I don't want to get bit on the feet. I said, you'll never get bit on the feet if you stay on the bike. She said, why? I said, because, baby, as long as you're on the bike, your feet are moving. And I said, you are afraid of the dog hurting you. But what you don't understand is that while your feet are moving, the dog has enough sense to know that if your feet hit his face, he's going to get hurt. So what he's going to do is he's going to chase you, but he'll never bite you because you're on something that moves. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but as long as you keep moving, you're going to kick that devil in the face. As long as you keep moving, you're going to kick those demons in the teeth. Don't you get off of your vehicle. Don't get out of your Bible. Don't get out of your worship to deal with a devil. You stay 
stay in your worship and you kick that devil in the mouth. That's why the Bible says we have the authority to place our foot on the serpent's head. You keep moving no matter what's chasing you. You keep moving no matter what's after you. You keep moving no matter what you see on social media. You keep moving no matter what racist demon has entered our earth. You keep moving no matter what you see in your mind. You keep moving because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. I came to tell you don't get off your vehicle. Don't come out of your worship. Don't come out of your praise. Don't come out of your prayer closet. Don't get out of your word. Keep it moving. Touch everything in your house and say keep it moving. When she got off her, her bike some time ago, my daughter has a scar on her right knee and it took almost two or three weeks to heal because when she was learning to ride her bike, she didn't know how to stop. So, so she jumped off the bike and the tire rubbed her knee and took the skin off of it. I said, baby, that's what's going to happen to the dog. She said, well, daddy, what if the dog tries to bite my tire? I pointed to her knee. I said, you, you see what the tire did to your knee? She said, yes. I said, baby, the same thing the tire did to your knee will happen to the dog's face if it tries to bite your tire. What I'm trying to tell you is that the devil can't mess with nothing that keeps moving. As long as you keep moving, you got security. As long as you keep praying, you got security. As long as you keep fighting, you got security. As long as you keep watching, you got security. Don't, don't get off of what you're on to deal with your enemy. Last point. Salt is precious. Salt is a preservative. Salt is a prophylactic. Salt is a spiritual protector. But lastly, salt was a producer. Salt was a producer. What do you mean? What do you mean, Pastor? What, what do you mean salt was a producer? Well, at the time of antiquity in the days of Matthew, Matthew didn't have Scots and miracle Grow for his plants. They, they didn't have that. So this is how they grew their crop. They put salt in the soil. <laughs> they put salt in the soil. Now you get this because the Bible says we are the salt of the earth. But if you translate the original language, it actually says we are the salt of the soil because the earth is the soil. And then God put salt in the soil. And the, and, and, and the olden day farmer knew that if he put salt in the soil, it would make sure that whatever he planted grew larger than it would without the salt. Salt was a miracle grower. Salt made things that were going to be medium large and made things that were going to be large huge and made things that were going to be huge gigantic because the salt made the ordinary thing grow. God told me to tell you because you're the salt of the earth, everything that comes through you in this next season is going to be bigger than you anticipated. Everything that God puts through you is going to be bigger. Somebody just shout bigger. Pastor Mike McClure had it in Birmingham, Alabama when he created the song Bigger. It's going to be big. I don't know who that word is for, but it's going to be big. The job that you're going to get when you come out of this is going to be big. The paycheck that you're going to get when you come out of this is going to be big. The house that you're going to live in in the next five years is going to be big. The opportunity God's about to give you is going to be big. Why? Because God has put the salt in the soil, and now you are a producer and get ready for the most productive season of your life to be on the horizon. You are about to find your purpose in this season. You are about to find your purpose in this pain. You are about to find your purpose in this moment and everything that comes through you in the next three years is going to be bigger than the thing in the previous three years. Get ready for bigger opportunities. Get ready for your name to be bigger than it has ever been. Get ready for your thoughts to blow your mind. That's what it means when a thought blows your mind. It means that the thought is bigger than the capacity of your mental state and I'm telling you right now God is about to blow your mind because you're about to see bigger speak bigger think bigger act bigger walk bigger because God is about to produce something through you so what am I saying as I close this message the world is a wound the world is a wound how do I know how do I know because we go through different wounds remember remember Jesus came out of heaven which was a big wound, and then put himself inside of Mary, which was a smaller wound, and then came out of Mary into the world, which was a bigger wound, so that he could ultimately go back to the bigger wound. And now we do it in reverse. We come through our mother's womb, and then we come into the earth, which is a larger wound, and then we go to heaven, which is the largest of wounds. Watch this. So God says, 
I'm about to put salt in the womb. I'm going to put salt in the womb. And when I put you in the womb, you preserve it. When I put you in the womb, you produce it. When I put you in the womb, you protect it. You think this world is bad now? My last word to you is, with all of the wars, with all the racism, with the police brutality, with COVID-19, with 25% unemployment, with human sex trafficking and cancer and HIV and AIDS and depression and abuse and rejection and insecurity, all of that is in the earth now, flooding, hurricanes, people dying alone in hospital beds, people not even being able to funeralize their parents and grandparents, women giving birth to babies in hospitals alone because of the transmission of a disease. You think the world is bad? Well, here's my final word to you. Imagine what it would be if you were not in it. Imagine what it would be if the salt wasn't here. You are the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the soil. God says, I'm going to use you to produce this world. I'm going to use you to preserve it. I'm going to use you to make sure that my presence is still in the earth. God, right now in the name of Jesus, bring us to the awareness of who we are. Show us your glory. Have your way in this earth. And we as Christians declare still the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Know who you are. Know what he has created you to be. And as my mama used to say, America, it's time for us to act our age and not our shoe size. God bless you. It's giving time here at the Lighthouse Church and at your house, and I hope that you are keeping the light on. Thank you so much for subscribing to our YouTube channel and watching our messages. Thank you so much for following us on Facebook and watching our messages. Thank you so much for watching us on Instagram with the clips and our IGTV. You are the reason we're here. Thank you so much for your support with our podcast, Take Action with Keon. And guess what? Through all of those medians, you all are giving in different ways because we are still about the mission of Christ. Do you know, I thank God, as to date, that we haven't had to lay off any of our 75 employees because of the gifts that you continue to give. Because of the gifts that you continue to give, we are still feeding thousands of frontline workers, and we are actually adopting entire hospitals, making sure that everybody who is going through a shift, and I know that's a shameless plug on the book, but everybody who's going through a shift from morning to afternoon, from first shift to second shift or the third shift, we're able to, to, to uh, take entire hospitals and feed all of the people who are eating through those shifts here on the north side and out there in Katy where we have a church and out there in, in the south end of town where we have a church. And thank God for our central church who is our youngest in demographic but doing a great work. All of our locations, all of our campus pastors are doing a great work. We're feeding people all over our city. People are coming here on Mondays and getting meals. We're still uh, doing online courses for our, for our students in the Abbey, Pre Abbey Preparatory Academy. All of this work cost. And the only way we're able to do it is because you are staying faithful in your giving. And I want to give you an especial encouragement because in a country where 40 million people are without work, we in the economy of God understand that our working class has nothing to do with our tithing class, that we give no matter what. And the Lord continues to give it back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Thank you so much for your gifts. There are three ways you can give. Number one, you can text to give at 832 nine two four zero four four three number two you can give on our app tlhc number three you can go online at lhhouston.church and you can give there 
If you are a part of our Lighthouse Church 2.0 members and you are online and, and, and you're with us, you can give through Givelify. And it's an app you can download on your phone and you can give through there. And I want to thank all of our friends from Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, through all of the things that you're going through. When we look at our registry and still see that you're still giving and about the things of God, thank you so much. They're also going to put a, um, a, a text message up on the screen right now as we're giving. I want you to understand that we're also about the social justice that is going on in our country right now. And if you'll text Floyd to the number that they're getting ready to put up right now, you're going to find out how to join the fight with us to make sure that no matter what our skin color is in this country, we can all get a fair shot. This is the work of God. It's the work of God. He liberated the Jews from the hands of the Germans. This is the work of God that all men would be free and that there would be no more slave, that there would be no more Greek or Jew, that we would all be precious in the sight of God. So I encourage you to text that as well. And I want to thank all of you all who are mailing and bringing your tithes to the Lighthouse Church. Our greater campaign is still going. The building is still being constructed. I think that when you get here, you're going to see your tithes and offering at work, and you'll recognize, oh my God, this building is immensely different from when I left it. And my God, we cannot wait to see you again. Somebody's been asking, Pastor, when are we going to open? When is the date? I want to tell you right now why I have your attention. There is no date. There is a state. There is no date. There is a state. When we are at a state, at a certain state, then I will bring us back together uh, at the most uh, intelligent and wisest way possible. But for the sake of having church, I am not willing to put you at risk so that we can come together to lose somebody we love. When it's safe, we will be back. And as long as you keep supporting from a distance, we can continue to bring you the Word of God and to keep everything in order. Are you ready? All right, I want you to repeat this after me. As I move towards greater, say this like you mean it, I will accept all divine ideas, thoughts, and concepts that will connect me to my destiny. I believe that what Jesus Christ has done for me is bigger than what anyone has, can, or will do to me. And because of his full gift, I will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. I decree and declare you're getting ready to go from borrower to lender in the name of Jesus. God bless you, and may God bless your gift 100-fold. Listen, I know you've been impacted by this dynamic service. You know, I make sure that you recap this. I hope you did a watch party to start off, begin with. But listen, I want to encourage you, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, I want you to take some time to be intentional about these next steps I'm about to give you. You ready? All right, here we go. So listen, I want you to sow into your future, into your destiny, into the ministry that God is using to speak into you. And of course, it's through his gift. So you can give um, by text. You can give through the LH app. You can also give on our website. Now, you might be saying, I'm really not a part of the ministry. I haven't really committed to the ministry yet. We've got room for you. You can give by using the Givelify app. It's always a way for you to give. We understand. You're just dating us for right now. But we'll bring you home soon. Now, listen, the last thing I want to do is I want to offer you the opportunity to join this ministry, join the initiatives, join in the vision and the leadership under our great leader, Pastor Keon Henderson. So if you want to take that step, a life-changing step, it's really simple. So here's the number. You simply want to text LH Nation to 84576. It's just that simple. Text LH Nation to 84576. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you for every seed, every tithe, every offering that's sown. We thank you, God, for every person who has decided to follow you who's made that decision to connect with this ministry. We thank you for the word and the worship from today. And in the midst of all that's going on, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love and for your covering. Now, Father, we speak peace and we speak wholeness and we speak the richness of your blessings to the life of absolutely every person that's listening, every family and household, every man, every woman, every child, boy and girl even the newborns that are on the way, we speak hope and destiny to their future. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. We love you, we'll see you next time.
Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. 